Okay, so I'll start with some motivation about non-local minimal surfaces, uh, how, how we start thinking about them. And this comes from motion of sets. There is a scheme due to Benz, Merriam, and Osher, known as BMO scheme, on how to make a set move. And the starting point, let's see. So we start here with the set E of Rn. Let's assume that it's very nice, smooth and bounded set, and we want to evolve it. And the way to evolve it, we want to diffuse it by some density. So we think that each point splits into a density. And this density is denoted by phi, but we rescale it to, to be support, I mean, uh, we, we rescale it by a factor of epsilon, yeah? And if we want to do that, we call here on the bottom phi sub epsilon to be the rescaling of phi that preserves mass, yeah? And the way we want to evolve the set E, so here throughout the, the notes, I would denote the characteristic function of the set E, so it's going to appear many times by chi sub E, so this is the characteristic function of the set E. And the way we make this set evolve is like this. So we start, we think that the original set E, E sub zero is the original set E, and then we create inductively by a scheme several sets, E k, and we obtain E k from the previous one in the following way. We convolved, let's think that we start at the very beginning. So we convolve the characteristic function of the set E with phi sub epsilon, which means that we diffuse the set E According to this, each point spreads out like this, and then we look at the new density, yeah? And then we segregate it back by looking where the density is bigger than one half, we call our new set, and where the density is less than that is the, is the complement of the set, yeah? So we diffuse it a little bit, and then we segregate it back according to the new density. Okay, so for example, what, like in, in one of the simplest cases, what would happen if phi of x is simply the average on the unit ball, yeah? So if our, if our density is simply the average on the ball, we, we assume that our density is radially symmetric for, for simplicity, yeah? Then when we, do, when we look at phi sub epsilon, this would be the average in the ball of radius epsilon. And then essentially, the way the set E evolves is to think, I want to look exactly at those points for which when I draw a ball of radius epsilon around them, I see exactly half the measure inside the set E, this is inside of the set E, and half the measure outside of the set E, yeah? So the centers of all these balls would be the boundary of your next set. Okay, and so, so the dotted line would be how the set, how the original set E moves after one iteration. Then you repeat this iteration on and on and on, and then what, you're going, what you expect to see, you expect to see a sequence of sets. But as epsilon tends to zero, you expect to see a motion of sets. Yeah? And the question is what, what is the law governing this motion? Yeah? And uh, so let's see, are, are there some questions about this uh, BMO scheme so far? Uh, no, no questions. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you, we have the original set E, you think you solved a little bit the heat equation. So if, if, for example, if this kernel phi would be the Gaussian, you think you solved a little bit the heat equation, and then you stop, and then you see where your density is bigger than one half, that would be your next set, and then, you, you do that again with the characteristic function of your new set. You keep on repeating, 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 and these sets are going to evolve, yeah? Okay, so now the question is what, what would be the governing law of this motion of sets, yeah? And it depends very much on the properties of this kernel phi. 
what's going to play an important role would be that because if I, if I take a point on the boundary of the set, let's think is the origin, and then I draw balls around, around this point, if I have to decide if it's going to be more than a half or less than a half, right? I mean, somewhere in, when I'm in the set, I see the characteristic function, I see one. When I'm outside, I see zero, yeah? So if the set, if the boundary, if the set is a half plane, the average would be exactly one half, right? If the, the average would be more or less uh, than, than one half, depending on how much on each circle here, how much of the boundary of each circle here is going to fall inside there or outside this. So there is this function here that is called the excess function. Well, first of all, some notation. Yeah, so the notation throughout, again, this is going to appear throughout the notes, the complement of a set E we denote it by E to the power C, but that, that denotes the complement, yeah? And then, this evolution, to understand better what happens with this evolution, one is to understand if you fix a ball of radius r, you want to pay attention how much measure on the boundary of the ball is in the complement and how much is inside the set. And they are opposite to each other, so if you subtract the, the n minus 1 surface measure of the complement to the 1 of the inside, and you rescale it, relative to the, to the surface of the ball, which is of order r dn minus one, we call this E of r the excess function. Yeah? So the excess function pretty much tells you in the ball of radius r, in average, if you are more on the complement or on the inside. And if it would be zero, means that is balanced. So if you look at this excess function for very small, uh, if, if in, in a set E and I pick a point, the origin on the set E and I pay attention for very tiny balls, what happens on the surface, that is going to just depend how the, sur how, how the set is curved near the origin. So if you, if you try to do an expansion very close to the origin, what you're going to get, you're going to get that the order in which if your, service, if, if your set is curved, the order uh, of E of R is basically given by R, and the coefficient in front is given by a constant times the mean curvature. Yeah. So here H denotes the mean curvature at the origin. Yeah. So this would be the, 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 how the excess function behaves near the origin. The excess function, just because we rescale like this, is always bounded above and below. Yeah. Okay. So now let's do some computation. Let's see if I'm if I sit at the origin, if I sit here, right at this point, I want to compute what happens when I convolve u with a rescaling of this uh, of this density phi, and how how does that compare to one half? Okay, so let's do a small computation. Okay, so let's see, let me see how I'm doing. Okay, so we look here at u at the origin minus one half, and what you get here, you essentially, the, the, this, the integral of this, of this quantity appears right away, this. Uh, and the, the, the integral over the boundary of bi of the characteristic function of phi minus the characteristic function of, of phi complement minus the characteristic function of phi. Be, okay, which is, which is encoded here. So this term here is simply says that I'm, I'm integrating on circles, yeah? And on each circle, I'm measuring, on, or in, on each sphere, I'm measuring how much is in the complement and how much is in the SETI, and I, I see what is this difference. And what I have here on, on the right hand side, this is simply the kernel rescaled. Yeah, my kernel is radial, G is the radial profile. Yeah? And the fact that this is rescaled by epsilon means that I'm, I'm rescaling this by epsilon and I integrate in R. Yeah? So here I'm already changing to, uh, to integration in R, I'm using the 
I'm writing first the integral is an integral over a circle, and then I'm integrating in, in, uh, in, in the radius. And the question is how large this integral is. So one way of doing it is you can change the co you can change uh, coordinates and uh, denote your new coordinate r times epsilon, and then the integral on the top is simply the same as the integral on the bottom. Yeah. So this is how much u of zero differs from one half. So if I sit on the boundary of the set E, then this would be the value of u of zero minus one half. Yeah. And now if you look at this integral, is how large is this? Uh, integral, and it depends very much on the decay properties of the function g at infinity. Yeah? So if I, if I think, for example, that g, let, let's think that g decays very fast at infinity. Yeah? So it's like, for example, let's assume that integral from 0 to infinity of g of r times r to the n dr is integrable. Or let's say even g is with compact support. Yeah? Then, the main contribution of this, I mean, my, fu my, my function is always bounded by a constant times r. Yeah? So actually, the main contribution on this integral comes from r being very, I mean, for r being in a bounded set, and this thing is pretty much going to look like the mean curvature times epsilon r. Yeah? So actually, what's going to happen if so, so, so I, look, I look at this term here, and I think I'm, I'm going back to this formula, right? E of epsilon r looks pretty much like a constant mean curvature epsilon r plus epsilon square terms, let's say, right? So if I, if I would plug that over there, then essentially I, I get an epsilon that comes out of the integral, and this r would go on the kernel, right? So what I would obtain, I would obtain a mean curvature times epsilon times g of r, r to the power n. Yeah, this r to the power n, I get from r to the n minus one and an r coming out from here. So, so what I obtain in the end that the way u differs from my one half is of order epsilon times a fixed constant, this constant depends on, on, on this integral, and n, times the mean curvature plus lower order terms in epsilon. Yeah? So this is the key, um, this, this is the first order in epsilon. Yeah? Okay, however, what happens if g does not decay this fast? Yeah? So what, what the, the, the requirement for g is that this thing is integrable. This is my kernel. So I, when I integrate phi, I, I know that the integral of g of r times r dn minus 1 dr is 1 of, from 0 to infinity. This is the integral of phi, right? So it says if phi of x times absolute value of x is less than infinity, if phi has finite first moments, then I end up that this difference is of order of epsilon. What happens if phi doesn't have finite first moments, yeah? And then what you, what you say, well, let's take an example in which the decay of g at infinity is slower than that, yeah? So, so what, you, what, you, what you want to say is you want to say that for, let's say for very large values of r, I decay like a power. So let's say g is precisely a power, but for very large values of r, right? If r is bigger than 100, this kernel phi has these tails. Yeah. Here, s should be in the interval 0, 1. I cannot take it below, I cannot take it um, below 0 because I want g of r times r dn minus 1 to have integral 1, yeah? So I cannot go below 0. If I go above 1, I'm in the setting of uh, finite first moments, yeah? So this, this would be the cases of tails that don't have finite first moments, yeah? Then if you go back at this integral, this one or the top one, and you plug g, I mean, if, if I take r in, in the second one, if I take r to be in a, in a compact region, this integral would still be of order epsilon. 
But what happens here is that this integral might have some contribution, more contribution coming from a big, when, when r is like a big constant to infinity. Yeah. So when you plug g as a power and maybe go on the first integral, what you realize is that actually indeed the error is larger if, if this is the, the decay of your kernel. And u of 0 minus 1 half looks like is of order e to the power s, which is much, not e, epsilon to the power s, which is much larger than epsilon. And then there is this integral from 0 to infinity of this success function, e of r divided by r to the 1 plus s dr plus a small o of 1. Yeah, so the difference when you have finite first moments that this is the formula that you get for, for the difference of u of 0 minus 1 half, while for fatter tails at infinity, you get a higher power, uh, 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 sort of a larger term, e epsilon to the power s, times this term. There is also a borderline case. So the borderline case is when s is exactly 1. When s is exactly 1, that is the borderline case where this integral is not, I mean, just barely becomes, goes from being uh, uh, finite to infinite, yeah? So in the borderline case, when you, when you look at the integral, you realize that you always have a contribution on each dyadic interval in R, and actually in the borderline case s equal to 1, you're going to get that u of 0 minus 1 half is of order epsilon log of epsilon. Yeah. And then the coefficient here is still the mean curvature, the classical mean curvature. Yeah. Okay, so this is what happens when I look at the value of u at the origin. Now, what happens with the normal derivative of u at the origin? So if I look at the normal derivative of u at the origin, I have a convolution, right? So when I put the new is the inner normal to the set, yeah? So when I compute that, I compute the inner normal to phi sub epsilon, and this term is essentially positive on half a space and negative on the other, right? If you take a bump function, phi, and you look at its derivative, its derivative would be negative, or would be positive up to zero and negative afterwards, yeah? However, if I sit at the origin, in half the space I don't see anything, and in half the space I see one, so at the end of the day, there is what I get in the end, I get that this normal derivative is pre pretty much of order epsilon to the negative one. The epsilon to the negative one comes because here I have a rescaling of phi. So the derivative picks up an epsilon to the minus one because it's rescaled, yeah? And then I get a fixed constant depending just on g plus smaller order of one, yeah? While the second derivative is always bounded by a cos and epsilon to the minus two, again, because I'm rescaling the kernel of, of I'm doing a dilation of order epsilon. So I know the value of u at the origin. I know its derivative, its derivative is of order epsilon to the minus one. I know the value, and I know that the second derivatives, let's say, are well behaved. So then I can decide pretty much how zero moved, right, because the, the, my set moves exactly at the point where u is equal to one half. Yeah? At the origin, it's not going to be one half, right? At the origin, uh, the, this value is not zero. I'm interested to find out the point where this thing is zero. That, that would be my, the boundary of the next term. Yeah? And because here I have this value and I know the derivative, I can find out exactly how the set moves. And essentially, at the end of the day, I get like this, that my set moves pretty much this amount, an amount of epsilon squared. I mean, there is an extra epsilon coming out from the normal derivative with respect to what I had before. So, so the set moves like epsilon squared times the mean curvature plus more lower order terms if the first moments are bounded. It moves like epsilon to the one plus s times hs, where hs is this, this quantity 
yeah, that we're going to call the non-local mean curvature plus small o of one. If my kernel has this sort of power decay at infinity, and if it has sort of the borderline case between this and this, which would be s equal to one, then the set moves an amount epsilon log of epsilon times the mean curvature plus O of one. Okay, so now if you think you do this scheme, I mean, all, all this is just like a, a discussion. But if you do this scheme, essentially says if you take your time variable to be like epsilon squared in the first case, and, and you run your scheme, you are going to see motion by mean curvature. You are moving in the normal direction according to this age. Yeah? This constancy zero depends on, on, on the kernel, yeah? but, but it's a constant. Yeah? So you're going to see motion by mean curvature. However, in the second case, you're going to see, you have to rescale time like epsilon to the one plus s. Yeah? So, uh, you, your set sort of moves farther than in the, in the first case. Yeah? In the first case, it just moves by epsilon squared. In the second case, moves like epsilon to the one plus s. If you rescale time like this, then you're going to get motion by this curvature, which is non-local curvature. And in the third case, if you rescale time like epsilon log of epsilon, you're still going to end up with motion by mean curvature in the borderline case. Okay, so this is sort of a motivation why one wants to study this sort of curvature, which is defined, so at the origin, this non-local curvature is simply defined as integral from zero to infinity of this excess function divided by r the one plus s dr. Yeah, so in the smooth case, I mean, of course, there is, there is, E of R is always bounded. Yeah, this excess function is always bounded, so there is no problem with this integral at infinity. This is integrable at infinity. There might be some problem near the origin. If E is just bounded, it seems that this is not integrable. Yeah. But if the set is uh, smooth, is C2, then we know that E of R behaves like R near the origin, so actually, this, this, this is well defined for C2 sets. Yeah. There is no problem at the origin. If you want to rewrite this, remembering what this excess function is, what you get, you get that this mean curvature is simply the principal value of, you take the characteristic function of the complement, you subtract the characteristic function of E, divide by absolute value of x to the n plus s, and you integrate in the whole space. Yeah? So this last integral is simply, I mean, if you want to write this formally, this is simply the fractional Laplace of this difference between the characteristic function, yeah? So in the complement, I put one. On the set E, I put negative one. When I look at this function, I compute the fractional Laplace at the origin, I get exactly the mean curvature. Okay, so this would be a motivation why, how, how this appears naturally. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to remember that, uh, yeah, that, that sort of the sets evolve differently if the tails are fat, yeah? And if the tails of, the, of this kernel uh, have this decay, like absolute value of x to the n minus n at infinity, we end up with this, with this curvature. Are there some questions so far? Yes. Uh, can you give a little explanation of why the borderline case epsilon one is in the Yes, yeah, so, so you get a log epsilon simply, okay, so if I, if I look at this, uh, if I look at, for example, at this integral here, and I think that g of r is r to the negative n, this would be the, the, sorry, g of r is r to the minus n minus one, yeah. What I get here, I can write this as e of epsilon, okay. So I can write e of epsilon r divided by epsilon r times dr over r. But dr over r remains invariant under scalings, yeah, so sort of, uh, so, so in this integral, if you look at each dyadic piece 
like if I take R to be between two to the minus K and two to the minus K plus one, and I, I split it into dyadic intervals, I realize that this weight for each dyadic interval is the same. So sort of in this borderline case, each dyadic integral counts the same, but because E of R over R near the origin looks like the mean curvature, that particular constant, as I zoom more and more and more near the origin, is going to appear more and more and more times. So, so, so I think this is just an analysis. Okay, like when I look at this integral, in general, I try to split in dyadic pieces. Yeah, so, so well, it depends, either of them. Yeah, so, so I would say here, uh, and sort of if, if I'm in the first case, in the first case, sort of the first dyadic pieces count the most. Like uh, when R is very close, it's like in a, in a compact interval from zero to one. Yeah. In the second case, when R is very large, counts the most. In the borderline case, all the dyadic pieces count the same, but most of the dyadic pieces are still in, in, in this regime, are still in the setting when epsilon R is small, so sort of still this, this formula here appears in most of the dyadic pieces, something like that. Yeah, I mean, we, we can discuss maybe more afterwards. So yeah, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit some, some details. I think these are like some small computations that, uh, that yeah, you, you can try to do on your own. Um, so, okay, uh, yes. But yeah, the, the idea is this, that sometimes the, wh what happens with R near epsilon is more important, sometimes what happens with R at infinity is more important, and the borderline case, all the dyadic regions count in the same way. Yeah. And that's where the log of epsilon comes, from, from size epsilon up to size one. Okay, so now let me just give another uh, I'll go maybe fast over this other uh, motivation how non-local minimal surfaces appear. So there is this density of, I mean, there is this theory of phase transitions. You think you have some fluid or some density U, yeah, uh, on, on uh, defined on some domain omega. And there is an energy associated to the density U, W. So W is a double well potential. Let's assume that W is a double well potential. And then you want to look at minimizers for, for the energy associated to U, but what is the energy associated to U? So this is sort of the free energy, W of U, as given here. However, I mean, you, in, in Alan Kahn energy model, you also add a small parameter, epsilon of gradient of U squared, and this term accounts for you don't want U to jump arbitrarily between negative one and one, yeah? If you just minimize the first part, W of U, U just wants to sit either here or here, or in fact, any combination between minus one and one would still be a minimizer for for this, this part. If you don't want to jump so fast between negative one and one, then you add this term, epsilon gradient of U square, which penalizes changes at small scales. I mean, this, this is a very small parameter, epsilon, but you still want to penalize the, 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 the jumps, immediate jumps between the minimums of W. So then what, what does a minimizer do of this particular energy? You still are going to have a region maybe where you're very close to one and some region when you're very close to negative one. If, if your boundary data, if, on some, if, you, if, you, if you look at this minimizer on the ball and in half the ball you give boundary data one on, on the boundary, on the bottom half you give data negative one, you still expect to see some one region and negative one region, 
but at some point you need to do a transition between them. And this is where this term comes, comes in. Yeah? And the question is what happens in that case? And there is this uh, famous theorem of Modica and Mortola saying that indeed this is the region U is going to be very close to one in, in, in some part and U is going to be very close to negative one, but these two regions are supposed to be uh, separated by an interface that is of order square root of epsilon, but moreover this interface is as epsilon tends to zero, gets closer and closer to a minimal surface. Yeah? So, so the theorem says that as epsilon tends to zero, minimizers u sub epsilon converge on subsequences. So you think you'd look at a bunch of minimizer more, and are we look at bounded minimizers between negative one and one. And we have some boundary data here. So if you look at minimizers, then they, on subsequences, they converge in some region to one, in some region to negative one. And the interface is a set of minimal perimeter or so-called like a minimal surface. Yeah? And why is that? I mean, intuitively, intuitively is like if you, if, you, if you go back and you look at this thing in 1D, if you look at this minimization 1D and you think I give some data one very far out to the right and data negative one, and I try to minimize this, then you get an ODE. And when you solve this ODE, you realize that basically you're going to get a, oh, I, we are almost like in this situation and we look on a line perpendicular here. So we're gonna get some region very close to one, then a transition of order square root of epsilon and then very close to negative one. When I say very close, I converge exponentially fast to one and negative one. But, so sort of, okay, so in some sense in each ball of radius square root of epsilon, I need to pay a little bit of an energy, right? But how do I arrange these balls to minimize the energy? So somehow you wanna, oops, so you, I'm going, Sorry, I'm here. So sort of you want also to have the length of the transition to be as small as possible to, to spend the least amount of energy. And that's why you want the length of the red part to, have, to, to be the least, to, to sort of span the least amount of area. So this is the idea. Now, if you look at this model in which instead of the Dirichlet energy, instead of saying that I want to penalize uh, things uh, epsilon times something that penalizes changes in U, if you look at a model in which slightly longer interaction are present, like the HS norm, and still I have this free energy plus this small penalization, then it turns out that you can have a similar result but the limiting one, I mean, you still, you epsilon, still, you still have this transition that you're very close to one in some region and very close to negative one, but the presence of this HS norm doesn't make the SETI to have minimal perimeter, but rather to have minimal HS perimeter, which is basically the HS norm of, of this. Oh, oh. So, so, so instead of, okay. So, so essentially, again, we see the non-local minimal surfaces appearing as a limiting of this allen kahn model in which we use HS norm or HS over two norm instead of the Dirichlet, yeah, which models, yes. Is there a restriction on S yeah, no, here yeah, S is still between zero and one. I forgot to write. So S is between zero and one. And if S is bigger than one, I mean, here the parameter S can go from zero to two. Yeah. So from zero to one, you end up with this setting. But from one, including one to two, you end up back to the mo modo, modica mortola. So it's exactly the same, the same phenomena that happens in the, in the first, uh, <laughs> when I talked about the motion of sets, is exactly the same range of parameters. So, so this is another instance in which non-local minimal surfaces uh, appear. Yeah. 
Okay, so we want to talk about non-local minimal surfaces, which would be basically minimizers of the HS over 2 norm of this quantity. But before we do that, I just want to say a few things, the classical minimal surfaces, yeah? So sort of to know what to expect in the non-local setting. So uh, there is a, a very rich theory about classical minimal surfaces. One of the best references is the Book of Justi. Uh, and the way to think about minimal surfaces, so you look sort of for surfaces of least area, but uh, mathematically, the, the convenient way to think about minimal surfaces is to think as bound, as boundary of sets. Yeah? So there is this trick that you always, instead of thinking about of a surface, you think uh, as the surface as being dividing the space into two and thinking of it as being the boundary of one of the two regions. Yeah? So, and instead, so the area surface of E, you call it the perimeter, of, sorry, the area surface of the boundary of E, you, you, you call it the perimeter of E which is the BV norm of the characteristic function of E, which by definition is simply the supremum. You take all smooth vector fields with compact support in omega, which here is drawn as a ball. So I'm looking for all vector fields with compact support here. And I'm integrating the divergence of G inside the set E. Yeah? And I call that the perimeter. In the case when E is a smooth set, then by divergence theorem, this would simply be G dot nu, where nu is the outer normal. And when I take the supremum over all Gs that are less than one with compact support, this is nothing but the surface measure, yeah? So, of course, this coincides with the surface measure if I'm dealing with smooth sets. But the advantage of this definition is that here, I don't need to say anything about the smoothness of E. All I want for E is to be measurable. Yeah? So if E is measurable, I can always define the perimeter. Of course, this thing might be infinite sometimes. Yeah? So it's fine. You give me any set, I can always talk about the perimeter of E in omega. Sometimes might be even infinite. But why, why one does this definition? Why, why do we look at minimal surfaces in this way as perimeters of sets? Is of course, so, so now I'll, I'll um, for the next maybe five, 10 minutes, I'll say some things about, um, about what are the key steps in this theory of classical minimal surfaces, yeah? So the very important, uh, to, let's say that makes everything work from the very beginning is this lower semi-continuity. If I have some sets, a sequence of sets converging to a limiting one E, here when I write E k tends to E, I mean I'm looking at the characteristic functions converging to the characteristic function of E in L1, yeah? so sort of in measure, I just want that basically the symmetric difference of E, K, and E has smaller and smaller measure, yeah? If this is the case, then the perimeters of E, K in omega are always in the limit far bigger than the perimeter of E. So if I take a, if I take a sequence of sets converging to a limiting one, then the limiting one will always have less perimeter than, than the, the, these ones, yeah? This is lower semi-continuity. The second one is compactness, saying that if you give me a sequence of sets that have bounded perimeter by above, I can always, I mean, they are good enough, they have, I can always extract a subsequence that converges in measure to a limiting one. Yeah? So this is compactness. Yeah? So once I have one and two, I can get or immediately the existence of minimal surfaces. Yeah? How do you prove the existence? So you say, give me a set E in, that is fixed outside B1. Yeah, so, so I'll draw maybe here a, a picture. So you think that you give me some red set that outside of you of, of the B1 is fixed. 
but then you want to fill it in. You are allowed only to modify it inside this ball, the red set. But at the, on, the, at the end, you want the perimeter to be the least it can be. Yeah? So then what you expect is in, inside this set where you can modify it, you have to minimize the perimeter, yeah? which means you're going to get some minimal surface. In 2D, you're going to get some straight lines. Uh, like the role of the set outside of E is simply as boundary data, right? I mean, I mean, of course, this is irrelevant what I do outside. The, the set E outside is just the boundary data. What is very important is how much perimeter you, you, you would put inside, yeah? And you get immediately existence of, of, uh, of minimizers, but you have no uniqueness. Like in this particular way, in this particular example, there are two minimizers. One, you, you want your set to do this, and, and the perimeter inside B1 would be the sum of these two, two segments. But you can also connect them like this, if, if this would be like the, the vertices of a, of a square. Yeah? So both this and this in the 2D case would be minimizers of the perimeter. Yeah? So there is no uniqueness. But that's how you, okay, okay. So how do we uh, talk about minimal surfaces? We said that the set E minimizes perimeter in omega if always the perimeter of E is less than the perimeter of any competitor where the competitor is just a compact deformation of E. So I'm, I'm only allowed to modify E by a compact deformation inside omega but I'm not allowed to go to the boundary. Yeah? So this is what you would call a minimal surface in, in a classical minimal surface or, or a set that minimizes perimeter. So let's say, are there some questions about, so far about this? Okay, so now what can you say about classical minimal surfaces? So initially you can only say that they are measurable sets. I mean, you get existence, but you get it in this very weak uh, setting. There exists a minimal surface as a boundary of a measurable set. Of course, you want to say that it has better properties. And now I'm going to mention some, some properties of, that make things better. One of them, yeah, so one of them would be density estimates. Density estimates says if you give me uh, such a minimal set and I pick a point on its boundary, then if I draw any ball around it, it has some measure in E and some measure in the complement of E. I mean, some, so, so the density in a ball of radius are of the volume of E and the complement are always bounded by above and below. These are known as density estimates. And essentially, this is almost like Lipschitz regularity from a measured theoretical point of view. It says that if I have a minimal surface, it splits space. Uh, I cannot have a cusp. I cannot have a cusp-like point on the boundary of a minimal surface. Yeah, it's like always it splits space in, according to the volume, more or less in a proportional way. What I see on one side and what I see on the other. Yes. Uh, Tim, is, uh, I was wondering if there's an example of uh, that the density is not upper bounded or lower bounded. Could you give some examples? The, the, the density in, in general, yeah. So, so, so yeah. So, if you take, sorry. So, let's see. So, if you give me a set like this, for example, right, and you fix on the point, and you look at the point as you draw balls then closer and closer and closer, the proportion between how much is outside of the set and how much inside the set is uh, tends to one and so on. So you, you would fail one of the two. So whenever you have cusp-like points, you would fail this density uh, property. Yeah. So minimal surfaces, they have this density property. You have compactness of minimizers, meaning that if you give me a bunch of minimal surfaces, you can always say that they converge to, a, to another one. Yeah? So if, you are, if you live in the class of minimal surfaces, uh, you remain there in, in terms of compactness. 
there is something that is very important known as monotonicity formula. So monotonicity formula says that if you look at a minimal surface and if you measure how much area you have inside a ball of radius r, how much perimeter you have inside the ball of radius r, relative to the diameter, let's say, yeah, uh, the, the measure of the diameter, which would be r dn minus 1, this is always increasing or let's say decreasing if you zoom in. Yeah? So if, what, what it really says, it says that if I look at the red line, the red measure that is inside the larger ball, relative to the radius to, to divide by the, diam by the measure of the diameter, and how much I will have in the inner ball, in the inner ball I always have less area as I zoom in more and more and more. Yeah? So th this is known as monotonous formula. And you would have equality only if, um, only if this set is completely, it's a cone. So, so it, it is not only that it's monotone, but with equality only if the red set, sorry, sorry, only if the red set, sorry, that, Maybe it's something. Whoops. Okay, sorry. So if the red set would look like this, then the density would always be the, the in the monotonicity formula, it doesn't matter which ball I take, this one or this one or this one. If I look at how much perimeter I have in a ball relative to the, to the surface area of the ball, like properly rescaled, this would remain constant. But this is the only possible situation. So the monotonicity formula tells you that when you zoom in more and more and more near a point, you expect to see something closer and closer and closer to a cone type situation. So this is like the blow ups. It says that if the boundary of E is a minimal set, and zero belongs to E, and I start doing a blow up of E, blow up of E meaning I'm zooming in more and more and more and more. Then on subsequences, I'm going to converge to a limiting set. The convergence is always in the sense of measures, like this, like, like of sets. And this limiting one is a minimal cone, meaning it's going to look like this in the limit, and it's going to be a minimal surface. Yeah? So the monotonicity formula is key to end up, I mean, to, to end up with this minimal cone type situation. Finally, some, uh, let's see, yeah. So uh, then there is a result saying that flatness implies regularity. So most of the time, what you would expect generically, generically you expect that as you pick a point on some surface and you zoom in more and more and more and more, you are going to end up more or less with a half plane. It's especially if, if, if you, so, so this tells you that if you are very close to a half plane situation, if the minimal surface is very close to a half plane situation, then actually the, the surface is really smooth. Yeah? So it's, this, this is like some sort of openness of regularity, saying if I'm very close to a good situation where I know that the minimal surface is smooth, then actually even the perturbed one is still remains smooth. And it's like an epsilon regularity result. And then in the case of minimal surfaces, there are this thing, one would really try to understand all possible blow up cones. Yeah. And these are like some famous theorem, Simon's theorem from the 60s says that the minimal cones are always half spaces up to dimension seven. So if I'm in dimension seven or lower, there are no such minimal cones. All of them are just half planes. Yeah. But if you go in dimension eight or higher, there are cones that are minimal. So if you look at this symmetric cone in R8, given by, if I do x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x4 squared less than x5 squared plus so on plus x8 squared, this is 
minimal in R8. Yeah, so there is like a clear dimension in which from dimension eight on you might have some singularities, not the minimal surfaces don't necessarily have to be smooth. Okay. And finally, the last thing that I want to say about classical minimal surfaces are that you can do dimension reduction, meaning that once you know that up to dimension seven, things are, are, are always smooth because there are only half planes as, as minimal cones, then even if you go to higher dimension, you can always say that the set of singularities, that the boundary is a smooth surface, except on a small singular set of dimension n minus eight. n minus eight comes exactly from this eight from here. Yeah, because eight is the first dimension in which some non-trivial minimal cone exists. And finally, you can say what happens if I don't look for surfaces in general, but I restrict myself to the setting of graphs. Yeah? So this would be like the minimal graph situation in which you think I want to minimize uh, the area or the perimeter, but inside a cylinder. And if you give me boundary data that is graphical, then you have a unique minimizer, so now you have uniqueness, and there is a unique minimizer that is smooth in all the dimension and achieves the boundary data continuous. Yeah. So now, I mean, I see I'm almost at the end of my lecture, so I took a little bit more time with this introductory stuff, but it's important because essentially all these things are true for classical minimal surfaces, and one would like to reproduce them also in the non-local setting, yeah? So, so a lot of them look similar, but there are some interesting differences, and some things cannot be done, and some things are better, some things are worse in the case of non-local minimal surfaces. So let me just take the last two minutes just to, for the purpose of the next lecture, just to introduce the, what are the non-local minimal surfaces, yeah? So I'll take two minutes. So now we want to define the perimeter, but the fractional as perimeter, yeah? So you start with this parameter S in zero, one, and E is a measurable set. And the S perimeter of E in omega is defined as the, as the HS over two semi-norm of the characteristic function of E in omega, it's not clear what it means <laughs> in general when we talk about the fractional norms, you have to define them in the whole space. However, here when I say that I'm just paying, right, why? Because the HS over two norm involves some integral in X and Y in the whole space in Rn cross Rn, yeah? But if I want to pay attention only what happens in the set omega, basically I have to ignore all the contribution in this integral that come from outside of omega, yeah? So by definition, the semi-norm of the characteristic function of E in HS over two of omega is the standard HS over two norm, but in which I ignore all the contribution that come from the complement of omega. Here we always think that omega is a nice bounded set like B1, yeah, with, with nice boundary. If I look at this HS over two norm, if both X and Y are in E or both are in the complement of E, these things are, are not here at all. So at the end of the day, this thing is non-zero only when X is in E and Y is in the complement of E or vice versa, or when X is in the complement and Y. By, by symmetry, this one half becomes a one, that's why I put a one half here. So here I don't, I, I just get that the perimeter of E is basically, I'm looking at all the contributions between X and Y relative to this kernel and uh, when X is in E and Y is in the complement of E. So this is the, the perimeter. What is very important throughout the theory is basically this, if you want bilinear form, how, if you give me two sets A and B, what is the energy generated by A and B? So if I integrate among all X in A and all Y in B, this kernel, one over X minus one plus A, 
that's what I call L of A, B. And L of A, B, of course, is symmetric. I, I ignore a lot of times the S, yeah? I mean, I should put an S everywhere, but for the, I mean, for, for notational simplicity, we remove it from there. Is uh, linear, sort of, in, in, in each variable. If I do the union of two disjoint sets, I can split this energy like this, is additive. And also has this scaling property. If I dilate two sets, A and B, by lambda, then the energy here picks a lambda to the n minus s. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. So finally, I'll, I'll, this is the last slide. So when I look at the perimeter of a set E inside the ball, like omega, wh what does it really uh, consists of. So basically, I have to take all the x's in E against all the y in the complement of E, but I have to ignore the ones that come from the complement. So here I have four regions. One, which is E inside B1. Two, which is E outside B1. Three, which is the complement of E inside B1. And four, outside. So basically, the perimeter of S in E, I have to integrate x in 1 against three against four, and also y in three against two, yeah? So I, I have to pair all one with three, one with, one with four, two with three, but two with four is ignored because they both come from the complement. So this is the perimeter of a set uh, E. And it's not difficult to see, for example, that if the boundary of E is smooth, then uh, this is a finite Initially, it's not clear if this is finite, right? Because when x and y are very close, they contribute a lot, a lot to the energy. I'm integrating 1 over x minus y to a negative power. Yeah? But so, so the last thing I say, for example, if I look at 1 over x minus y to the n plus s dy, and I'm integrating this quantity for all y's, and this is bigger than r. So if I take think that R is this ball here, and I integrate against all Y's that are outside of the, of the, of the green ball, then this, the answer of this just by scaling is like R to the minus S, yeah? So whenever I, I take an X inside the, the set and I integrate all, against all the Y's outside of a set, I get at most like distance to the boundary raised to the power minus s, yeah? So this is integrable as long as s is less than one. When s becomes equal to one, this is, that's the borderline case in which is no longer integrable, yeah? So that's why we consider this parameter s between zero and one, so that characteristic functions have finite energies, and then we can minimize among characteristic functions. Okay, so I apologize, I took a little bit longer. I'll stop here. So next time we'll really discuss much more about non-local minimal surfaces and their properties. Yeah.